like a fairy tale. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there lived in Venice a very wise old Jew, deep in knowledge, and a handsome young man to whom he tried to impart his wisdom. Those, those ants at the far end of the lagoon, they're really men, of course, building a ship. People here in Venice, sailors in particular, are suspicious of those people. Hostile. You know why? No. Because the ship is doing something different, something that's never been seen or heard of in Venice or anywhere else. They're putting the wood together for the hull in a new way. Things are changing. Many things are going to change, Marco. No. Not for me. When I came back from the harbor, I'd been down there watching them build that new kind of ship. I. I carved the date on my window, May 12th, 1971. It marks the evening when I realized this century was over. Good riddance. It was getting old anyway. And you're young. And when your old teacher is speaking to you, what are you doing? Playing with your life. Trying to bring off an impossible trick that can only end by blinding you. Marco, be serious. Try to believe me when I tell you that man has started changing the world. You're not even listening. I've lost my last years teaching a child. I've been teaching you all these years since your father left for China. Teach you all I know. No, Master. The little that is good in me, I owe to you. It's just because I'm no longer a child that I get angry when I feel the world evading me. Oh, Marco. Even if your fathership does return, it won't be as gold it will get you the world. It's you, yourself, you. But how? With people thinking my father is ruined and probably lost, I'm not worth anything here in Venice. You're Marco Polo, my pupil. You're 20 years old. Venice is not the world. Do you know what the banker Spinello dares to say about my father on the pretext that we owe the most money to him? Let him talk. No, I won't. I won't let anyone say anything about him. Ever. There's not much I can do, but I certainly can keep him quiet. Look here. Because you're the only living creature I love, I've cut these points with a knife on my beautiful astrolope. These are the positions of the stars in the sky at the hour when you were born. And what do they say, these stars of mine? I've told you already a hundred times. Glory. And prison. <laughs> the two sometimes go together. All the same. Start off with the glory. Where are you going? Probably not to glory, but maybe to prison. I'm going to play chess with Spinello. Those bankers must learn that the world contains something other than what is found in their account books. What's that, Marco? Honor. <laughs>
Senor Spinello. Good day. Have you heard the news, Senor Spinello? The Cape Chromatici lookout sighted a vessel at dawn, making for Venice. Answering the description of my father's ship, the San Marco, sailing before the wind and all sails flying. Don't make me laugh. The Cape Cormatiki lookout is drunk. Suppose it's true and the San Marco is really going to dock in the lagoon tomorrow. With a cargo of all the perfumes of Araby, all the carpets of Persia, all the silks of China. Then the laugh would be on you, wouldn't it? Marco, my boy, I would have hundreds of thousands of reasons to be pleased. Hundreds of thousands, you understand? But the Cape Cormatiki lookout? is a drunkard. On the horizon, there first appeared a little black dot which grew until it took the shape of a ship. A real ship making its way with all sails spread to Venice. It was the San Marco, bringing back Marco's father and his uncle. But contrary to Marco's expectations, their return did not bring him the immediate good fortune he'd expected. Their merchandise had been confiscated in Byzantium, which was at war with Venice at the time. And when the Polos came home, they were ruined. Destiny, politics, war. Creditors always understand these things. What they do not understand is that they are not paid in spite of them. Soon, the Polos, seated alone at the end of the table, were like two defenseless animals tracked down by a pack of hounds. Only our word. That is to say nothing. As far as Venetian merchants are concerned, nothing. I regret that the seal may be broken by only the Pope. What I can tell you is that the parchment contains an offer liable to change the whole future of Christendom. For the moment, let us forget about the future of Christendom. Let's talk about our 250,000 ducats. I propose a vote, gentlemen. For my part, I vote for bankruptcy until such time as there are wares lined up along our keys to cover our 250,000 ducats. All of a sudden, the Polo's luck seemed to change. As you may have noticed, I said nothing. But there is one thing that the others do not know. My dwarf just told me the new Pope is elected. Gregory of Piacenza. Gregory of Piacenza? Then we are saved. Unless the tiara changes him. That's true. Gregory, before he became Pope, was your friend. I don't believe the tiara will change his heart. Here you are. Here's some gold for you. I'm sure you'll need it. You're bringing the Pope a message. And if the world is going to change, there'll be plenty of money to be made. The rats are coming back on board. That's always a good sign. Agree. Split three ways. Well, after all, we're good friends. <laughs> Now, let us keep our heads. We've known a bishop who was our friend. Now, we're going to see a pope. There is a difference. Well, all I'm saying is that he used to bounce Marco on his knee. Marco. You know, Father, I'm getting to like this place after all. Yes, I've heard, Marco. I've heard that most of the time I was away, all you worried and talked about was girls. That may have been all I talked about, Father. But it's not all I thought about. All the same, try to behave yourself while Maffeo and I see his holes. I do not question the Polo's sincerity, but I fear they are naive. My secretary believes that the Emperor of China is planning a war against Christendom. I assure you, Father Vincenti, that Kublai Khan wants only peace. 
and waits for a word from His Holiness. A message to lull us to sleep while he prepares for war. We have gathered definite information from our own sources. It's true, a war party exists, but the Emperor opposes it. Why should we trust him? He has asked for priests to be sent to teach Christianity to the Chinese and requests holy oil from the sepulcher in Jerusalem. A trap, Your Holiness. I believe that Kublai Khan opposes his war party and awaits word from us to strengthen his resolve. That word he will get. It is important that our policy should be known to him as quickly as possible. Niccolo, Mafio, you know him. He trusts you. You must bring my message of hope to him. I shall send with you two holy Templars. They will deal with all spiritual matters. And Marco will do the rest. Marco? Why Marco? The Pope wanted to see Marco. What was going through the mind of that wise old man? The Emperor of China had asked the Pope to send a hundred wise men to teach him about the West and about the Western religion based on gentleness and love, which fascinated Kublai Khan. The Pope knew very well that he did not have a hundred such wise men in all of Rome. But when young Marco stood before him, the Pope was struck by the handsomeness of the young man, by his frank and open expression. An idea came to him which astonished and shocked the Christian world of that time. Later, it would be said that he was inspired by the divine spirit and guided by his judicious mind. Since he did not dispose of a hundred wise men, why not send the emperor a single young man, the most courageous and handsomest to be found? M me, Holy Father? As the Pope gazed upon Marco, he smiled and thought to himself that youth and beauty are like a blessing from God and that they might do more than the knowledge of many wise men. Guess who it is? Marco! <laughs> Five, ten, fifteen years, who knows? Where have you been? You know we're in a hurry. <laughs> I've been saying goodbye to all my tutors. So the Silk Route, by a strange decision of Pope Gregory, was opened up one fine morning in November 1271 to a young Venetian only 20 years old. Marco did not know that he would not return along that route till half his lifetime had gone by. The first port of call was the Holy Land. Concerning this mysterious caravan spread with lightning rapidity through the Orient. The Pope's messengers would be followed and spied upon until the end of their journey to China. Take good care of Father. Sir. Ah! 
and saw that the lad was ready at any moment to forget the seriousness of his mission, that he was all too easily ready to follow a pretty face, they were concerned. They did not dare to question the wisdom of the Holy Father, but in their Templars' minds they were sorely troubled. Meanwhile, the caravan of the Polos had reached a part of the desert under the domination of Alaou, a young and powerful Arab chieftain with whom they had become friends on their previous voyages. You are a village idiot, an ignorant swamp buffalo. Quiet! Don't you ever dare enter my tent again during siesta hour, you disrespectful goose! Nicolo Polo is coming! Ah! Nicolo Polo, my brother, why did you say so? Go tell the women to prepare a great feast for tonight. Go on, hurry up! Leaving again. Don't be impatient with me, beloved. Nicolo Polo is like a brother. It is not fitting that I do not go out to meet him. I never see my husband. What? I spend every Sabbath Eve with you. Doesn't that prove I love you? If you love me, you get rid of some of your wives. Oh, that means nothing. It's just an old custom. But you're the only one I love. My father was happy with three wives. And my uncle Abdullah had only two. You have 26. 26? It's just a custom. I don't like your having so many wives.
You are Venetians? Yes. Merchants. My master, known to his people as the old man of the mountain, invites you to be his guests. The old man of the mountain? I thought he was a legend. You will soon see the legend for yourself. We appreciate the invitation, but you see, we're in a hurry. Maybe on our way back. You've just passed through a village. There's a side, the old man. and ignoring honor. Is that what you learned fighting for Christ all your life? Yes. Now, will you please accept our gracious invitation? I am not going with you. You'll have to take me. Take him. But remember, our master wants him in one piece, if possible. Why don't you take me? Must you be a nuisance? You coward. Having your men do your dirty work. You! You take me! would have been to do nothing. I had dreamed of dying for the glory of Christ, not yours. But you seem troubled, brother. Are you not happy to see me? My son Marco was to have met us here. He was due yesterday. <laughs> he will arrive tonight or tomorrow. Nothing happened or my scouts would have reported it. Come, let us refresh ourselves. Come on. Ah. I have sent scouts to look for Marco. If he is late, he'll catch up with you. You can leave tomorrow morning as planned. Oh, knowing Marco, he'll catch up with us, one way or another. Yeah, stop worrying, friend Niccolo. As long as he's on my territory, he's as safe as a baby in his Good. mother's arms. But eat. I have prepared a great feast for you. Alliance between Kublai Khan and our hope can mean peace for the world for generations to come. Yes, your mission is of the utmost importance. It can change the history of the world. They must surely both realize how important it is. It may be the beginning of an age of real peace and goodwill among all men. More cultural exchanges. Years exchange. Books of learning translated. An enormous increase in trade. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, go on, I'm listening.
retreat of the old man of the mountain to which Marco and his companion were taken was an immense palace hewn into the side of a mountain. This palace had a strange and sinister reputation throughout the Orient. It was known that it contained fabulous riches, the rarest animals, a priceless library, and a collection of beautiful women who had been captured for the old man of the mountain in the four corners of the near and far east. It was said that they proffered rare and forbidden pleasures to a cohort of young warriors selected after terrible trials in which most of them lost their life. The old man taught to those who survived to have contempt for everything. Trained to be cruel and without pity, they became dreaded assassins who killed at the bidding of the old man. According to the legend, this pope of crime and of evil, whose nihilistic religion was based on the denial of all moral truth, had no age and no name. It was also said that he would never die. He wore a mask of gold which he removed only before those who were about to be put to death. One day before his death, he would secretly select another man who would replace him behind the golden mask and who, sharing the same philosophy of evil, would in turn become absolute master of life and death throughout the kingdom. Aristotle? Plato? You said he was a sort of pope of crime and cruelty. I still say it. The embodiment of everything evil in man. Oh, how could evil be done among so many books of wisdom? Each man takes from a book only his own truth. That is also true. What are you hiding from? Let me see your face. You will see it. Perhaps sooner than you care to. There are many ways to come down a flight of stairs. But only one way to reach paradise. His face looks very ordinary to me. Just another fat man's face. <laughs> You're the kind of rascal I could love. You're the kind of rascal I hate. <laughs> I like you. It would please me if you stayed with me. Of your own free will, without any persuasion. You like me too, huh? Eh? Admit it. If you want me as a friend, release us. Oh, you looked at your holy peddler, so he is the guardian of your faith and conscience. <laughs> you look at him. You will soon thank the old man of the mountain for what he's going to do for you. He's going to show you that the beliefs they sang into your head as a child Nothing but illusions. Yeah. We'll do it for you because I like you so much. Don't like me so much. I can't help it, I just do. Your holy creation claims such great spiritual power that he can make the body of his God out of piece of bread. <laughs> he will show that this holy man's faith which still imprisons your mind, is a very little lie. Lie! Not even a big one. Pray. <laughs> pray, pray. But the little hashish would do him more good. A small gift of suffering, and he will renounce his faith as one does with a poor relation. <laughs> Before you touch as much as one hair of this man's head, you'll have to kill me first. No one will touch him. He's going to listen to a bell. That is all. Christians like to hear the sound of bells, don't they?
what's left of your holy man's faith, he will now spit upon his God. This is much simpler and quicker than asking him what he believes or does not believe now. Such is the strength of the faith you were led to believe in. Yes, of course. Oh, it grieves me that you can spend so little time with me. But I shall expect you on your way back from China. Please, don't interrupt me, please. Thank you for everything. Huh? Sleep well. And don't worry about your son. To dishonor someone in his own eyes is the true meaning of torture. And the old man believes he has won. But he is lost! I'm going to die! To die like a coward! No, no. Come. It's all right. No, you have been more than a man. And you have shown true courage. I will never forget you. Because of you, I have... I have faith again. If that were so, my son, then I would be less afraid of appearing before him. Prepare 15 men armed and an empty horse. Let the polos sleep. In the morning, tell them that Marco will join them within two days.
The Mongol prince Nayam entrusted me with five bags of gold to interrupt the journey of five Christians on their way to see his father, the Kubilai Khan. For me to interrupt the journey of five Christians. All right. <laughs> oh, but my friend, enough of this haggling. Would you allow me to give you one of my mountain flowers? I know how much my friend Ahmed likes flowers. Does she please you? Mmm. Oh. Wait for him. My gift cannot share your couch, my dear friend. But I know how much you love animals. Does she please you? Oh. A well-matched exchange. Worthy of two old friends who trust each other. It is difficult to fully trust a friend whose face one never sees. I would consider it a friendly act if you removed your golden mask. It is a friendly act that I do not remove it. All who see my face die. But your assassins all see your face. And all die and go to paradise the moment I tell them their time has come. But the women, the women you love, surely you remove your mask for them. Oh, if you only knew how much it hurts me to lose so many loved ones. <sighs> Do you still wish me to remove my mask? Who, me? Did I ask for that? No. <laughs> Disappears when my eyes feast on you. Say it, my dearest friend. Refresh yourself. Oh. Well, beloved brother, how is business? Oh, I cannot complain, my dearest brother. The desert winds have blown the most beautiful wives to me. Oh, if only those desert winds would blow through my humble house. I'm bored alone. I'm so in need these days of a vision, <laughs> a lovely vision, prayer. Pray, hello. Describe to me your sweetest wife. To you, my valued mountain eagle, I will impart the vision of divine Yasmina, my loveliest wife. But go on, unmask yourself. We are alone. Yes, of course. You are the only one who sees my face and is not sent to paradise as a reward. And it's much cooler with her. I know all about your hashish paradise, my dear brother, but why continue the foolishness of wearing this empty mask? Now could I command respect and terrorize with a face like this and body like this? This image is immortal, and the rabble always follows the image, not the man, but uh, proceed, proceed with your lovely vision. Where shall I start from? The feet or the head? Um, well, whatever you think best, she's your wife. The feet. Ah, her feet are of classic and exquisite proportion. With each toe a little poem of love. Her delicate ankles flare into legs of pure, perfectly shaped alabaster and milk. Mm -hmm. From there, ay, 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 she is so divinely rounded that your fingers burn to caress her. No. And when her slender arms embrace you, her velvet fingers touch you with such art 
your body quivers and sings. And suddenly you learn the passion of true love. Her eyes are like two beacons of love's distillation calling to all that is man in you. Come, my beloved. Come to me, my beloved. Come. Now, brother, I want you to release Marco Polo to me immediately. Oh, you shattered the most glorious vision of my cousin. How could you so wound your beloved friend? We have an agreement, beloved friend, that you do not molest the caravans crossing my trade routes. Marco Polo is not a merchant. He is a shrewd peddler of Christianity. I do not care what he peddles. He was in a caravan under my protection and I want him back. No, no. It will not be good for us if he reaches Kublai Khan. Let the Mongols fight the Christian. It will be better for us. I want him now. And no more talk. Hello, we are going to be trapped. We've got the Mongols here. We've got the Crusaders here, and everybody's fighting for the promised land. We had the Jews like a thorn in our sides for 2,000 years. Now we're going to get caught like a nut between the Jewish Christians of the West and the Christian Jews of the East because they're going to spread Christianity to China. Can you imagine Chinese Jews? Old man, I know of your negotiations with the Mongols. I also know they have been paying you well. Well, some small gifts that mean not... Now look, you have wounded me many times this day, my distant cousin. My stepbrother, I fear I must inflict yet another cut. Now look, will it be painful? I fear so. Do you remember that gift you gave me of that well-known dagger with a gem encrusted hilt engraved with your insignia? Well, that was a loving gesture. So it was accepted. But unless Marco Polo is delivered to me unharmed, that well-known blade will be found between the shoulders of Ahmed, Prince Nayam's envoy, now enjoying your hospitality. Now that would not be good for you. That would not be good for Ahmed either. Well, if you must kill Ahmed, you must. But please, please use another dagger. Now, you know that when I die, this mask is meant for you. I, I want you to have my kingdom. I have a kingdom. I do not need your kind of kingdom. <laughs> I want Marco Polo. <laughs> Only you can cross me thus and be forgiven. I truly love you as a son. To prove it to you, I will bring you Marco Polo this very minute. Ah, my beloved friend. <laughs> Marco was drugged by the old man of the mountain and became a mere puppet in his hands. At least that was what the old man thought. But he did not know that the Venetians, masters of the science of poisons and antidotes, had given Marco a secret powder hidden in the setting of his ring. Plunge this dagger into Alaou's back before he leaves the castle. Before he leaves the castle. before he leaves the castle. I have horses outside. Go ahead. Show the way. Dearest friend, when Prince Nayam and his Mongol generals learn how you betrayed them, I fear for your life. Oh, this distrustful friend. All will come to pass as I say, and all will end happily. And then you said anyone who sees your face must die. That is true. Allahu saw your face. How do you know Allahu saw my face? I overheard everything. Then you too can see my face, my dear friend. Ah! 
It's so hard to lose a friend. Until I saw you, I thought for sure the old man was going to send me to his paradise. <laughs> ah. Thanks for delivering me. Ah, the pleasure's indeed mine. Perhaps one day I will have the honor of showing you the beauties of my land. I accept the invitation. Hey! But on our way back from China. Oh. Now, I must join my father's caravan. Where? One day's hard riding will take you to him. The shortest way is through Hasir Pass. Which direction? East. Here. Your father and uncle should be about here by now. We are here. Now you follow the valley east straight till you come to a fork. You take the left branch and you should meet about here. Or on the right, master. No, it isn't, and it's much but more master. dangerous to go to the right. Oh, but he has master, plenty of time. Better if he goes along the ridge. It's my Kalem. Yes, the ridge to the left. To the left, master.
Hello, children. What are you playing? We're playing we're merchants. With this. Suddenly, one day, Marco came upon what he thought was a clue. Oh, yes. Who gave you this card? There were two travelers who slept here one night. They gave it to me. And where did they go? They went that way, towards Samarkand. The boots are pretty. Here. Thank you. Good day. The children there just told me that two strangers had passed by here. How long ago was it and where did they go? It was two days ago. They came from the west and continued their journey toward the east. They took the trail which leads to Samarkand. Have you seen a young stranger from the West? No. In heaven, the two dead Templars now understood the profound wisdom of the Pope. In a situation where the wisest and most powerful of ambassadors would have been caught and killed like a dog, the handsomeness and youth of Marco gave rise to tender feelings in the heart of a young girl of a different race. And it was thus that he was saved. For what can the envoys of the most powerful army in the world do against the heart of a young girl who has decided to save the man she loves? Marco! Marco! It's me, Marco! It's Taha! What happened? Why did you follow me? I brought some horses, Marco. Can I go with you? I'm grateful, Taha. Don't thank of me. course you can come. Now we'll ride together, Marco, the two of us, all the way to Samarkand. Taha decided to leave her country and her people to show Marco the way to Samarkand. had decided at this moment that the message of Christianity to the fabulous master of all Asia should fall into the hands of a young girl in love. Samarkand at the crossroads of the trade routes. Samarkand, the melting pot. The Polo's caravan would have to pass through it on its way to the east. Marco stood a good chance of finding his father and uncle there. crossroads of the world, at the meeting places of travelers bearing secrets and laden with gold, there is always a dark and beautiful woman working for someone in a palace. Do as you're told. And I advise you to obey. These are Prince Nayam's orders. The girl with the whip, she was known under no other name, received much gold from the Mongols in return for her services.
you are a Venetian. Uh, yes. Two Templars, looking down and observing from their heavenly abode, wondered once more, with all due respect to the Pope, whether his choice of Marco was not too lightly made. Marco. Marco Polo. I like that name. It has a nice sound. I have decided. I would like to go to Venice with you. Oh. Don't laugh. When I decide something, I do it. But I'm not going to Venice. I'm going to China. But it's too late. You can never cross the Gobi Desert at this time of the year. Besides, there isn't a guide who would attempt it. I'll attempt it. I must get to the palace of the Kublai Khan. Why would you want to see Kublai Khan? Do not ask questions that require complex and difficult answers. Marco, your father! dangerous now. I like these animals, and I will not pay the price in grief for what I know is going to happen to them. Will you act as guides for us? No. And if I double the number of animals and provisions? Fine horse. How much? Not for the sale. Better. No. But why not? Hey! Marco! Hey! <laughs> well? No. I will triple your price. You do not understand. I'm not interested in your money. We are natives of this country. We do not need guides. We will be glad to help a stranger going through our country. Would you like to join us? All the guides have refused. Is there really no danger? There is danger everywhere. But we are men, and neither danger nor the bad season can make us afraid. All right, then we'll go with you.
A trap was set for Marco, a trap in which he should find his death. The girl with the whip knew this. The two Templars made up their minds and decided that the Pope's choice was a wise one after all. For the tenderness that Marco inspired in the heart of the girl with the whip, to her own surprise, inspired her with the courage to save his life. All right. Why did you follow me? What do you want? Shh. You'll see. Is something wrong? I have my horse over there. Let's go back. Just you and me. Oh, look, I've already told you it's impossible. Now be a good girl. Go back to Samarkand and forget about me. Hmm? this all the time. You're in on this. But I saved your life. I ought to kill you. Then kill me. Where's your horse? truly loved once, a girl whose entire life had been one of betrayal and deception was redeemed in a second. And so it is that great sinners can be received in heaven with a smile, often denied to the self-righteous. Marco had changed. Ever since the day when the Templar had died in his arms, he had seen the world in a different light. Marco had become a man. The Pope's choice had been a wise one. Marco knew that if he came out of the desert alive, he would meet other beautiful girls and that he might stop for an instant on his way. But he also realized that he had other things to do besides dancing his way through life as a carefree young man. He had been entrusted with a man's task.
There was a system of communication between men of goodwill as well. And these men, of whom the emperor himself was the leader, wanted the Pope's message to be delivered. Kublai Khan was born a Mongol, and his undisciplined warriors still believed that they had a right to pillage and to massacre the Chinese people as soon as they were any distance from the emperor's court. Kublai Khan's political wisdom was great. He had understood that from the moment he had become emperor of China, he no longer had the right to act like a despotic Mongol prince. And so it was that one of his first important political acts was to declare his decision to marry a Chinese princess and to make her his empress. He wanted to make clear to everyone his will to become one with the ancient race now under his domination. From the four corners of the empire, noble maidens were sent to the court so that the emperor might choose one of them. One of these princesses, on her way to Kambaluk, was due to make a halt at the monastery. The abbot realized that the only way for Marco to slip through the ambushes set on his route by the Mongols was for him to be a member of the suite of one of the noble princesses on her way to the emperor's summer palace. Prince Nayam, son of the emperor and chief of the militant Mongol party, 
practiced on straw heads on Sundays, a little game that he played in earnest on weekdays. It was he who had ordered that the polo's message be intercepted at any cost, for he hated the peace which his father, the emperor, was trying to achieve for all China. Nayam believed that the Mongols should stop at nothing till their bloody conquests reached the ends of the earth. The council meeting has started. The emperor has been asking for you. Officer! What are you doing? I am an envoy of His Holiness the Pope. Please inform your emperor that I have come to see him. Is this man with you? No, I am not. I am an envoy of His Holiness... Take Hol him away! Now, look here. I told you I am an envoy of His Holiness the Pope. Let go of me! The emperor will hear about this! What's happening there? Some foreigner dared to address one of the chosen princesses. <laughs> How can I order them to return to the vanquished the rice we have confiscated? My soldiers are hungry. So are the peasants. It is they, all us, and we are the conquerors. There is not enough rice to share. I ask His Imperial Majesty to speak now that he has heard the truth from his Mongol general. <laughs> Oh, please. You've heard the truth from your Mongol generals. I'm sorry, I was not listening. Oh, we have been speaking for hours. Yes, your noise disturbed my cat. I will speak softly then, your Imperial Majesty. Softly, I tell you, my soldiers will not understand why they must give back the rice to the very peasants they conquered. Not give. Share. I'm the Emperor of all China. The rice belongs to all my people. If your soldiers have not learned this, like Ken, you have failed in your duty. There is a solution if His Imperial Majesty wishes to feed everybody. In a matter of 30 days ride, the West will give you all you need to feed the 200 million of China. Better attack now before they attack us. <laughs> to wage war will kill generations. But if we become self-sufficient, our children and their children's children will never know the meaning of hunger. Surely that is enough glory, even for a soldier like Ken. May I take this opportunity, your Imperial Majesty, to welcome the prince who has finally left his horses. To a Mongol prince, attending to his horses is an affair of state. <laughs> we understand how difficult it is for a Mongol to become a Chinese. It is difficult even for our emperor. Yes, my head has become Chinese, my feet Lag behind. <laughs> then what has our emperor decided? To move with his head or his feet? One must learn to move with both. You will return to your provinces and tell your people it is peace and not war. And that within seven days they shall have a Chinese empress. These meetings are more tiring than a month's ride. You should attend. One day you will be emperor. I will listen only to the Emperor's opinion. It is impossible for one man to always be right. But right or wrong, he's the Emperor. The Princess is already, Your Serene Highness. Good. When will you wed? Chinese girls are too civilized. I like wild Mongol girls. I once knew a Mongol girl who was not wild. Come and help me choose. I'd rather wait for my generals than try my diplomacy. Princess Mai Ling, province of Quanxi, aged 18, 
plays the lute, writes poetry. Your extreme beauty will make an emperor's choice a delight. Princess Saitan, Hunan province, age 19, plays the lute, writes poetry. The extreme beauty will make an emperor's choice a delight. Princess Gogatin, Xinjiang province, Age 16, plays the lute, writes poetry. If your extreme beauty will make an emperor's choice, uh, who read her stars? Come closer. You are a child. I am 16. You will receive bountiful gifts to ease your disappointment. But it would be unseemly for an emperor to wed someone so frail. I have no wish to be the emperor's wife. Why? Do I displease you? No, Serene Majesty. Then why? Because you are the great Khan, and I fear you. Oh. And I love another. You love another? You could be put to death for saying that. But I love... Whoosh! Your life hangs by a thread. You could be tortured. My life is worthless, and he is in danger. In danger? He needs the Emperor's protection. He is on a mission from the West. His name is Polo. Polo? Marco Polo. His caravan was attacked and... The Polo's here in China? Niccolo here? No, Serene Majesty. Marco is here. In prison. Your Mongol horsemen attacked his caravan. Mongol horsemen? Only he escaped. Give him your protection, Serene Majesty. Mongols. There's a man in prison. His name is Polo. Bring him to me. Well. From your look, Father, the choice was poor. A caravan from the West was attacked by Mongol horsemen. Mongols are soldiers, not bandits. Which of you is responsible? Who accuses us? I accuse. But why us? There is very little that happens in our domain which you do not know about. Father, that is not just. Is your name Polo? Marco Polo. Any relation to Niccolo Polo? His son. Kneel in front of his majesty. He's not a prisoner, he's a guest. Tell me about uh, your father. Are you Kublai Khan? Oh, where is your father? I wish I knew your majesty. The Mongol guides leading us out of Samarkand attacked us and we were... <laughs> Why attack you? There were, there were many people who tried to prevent us from getting here. My father and my uncle were taken prisoner. I escaped unhurt, but my father made me swear that whatever happened, the Pope's message had to reach you. He said he'd even sacrifice me if he had to. So important was it to bring the message of peace in time. The two priests sent by His Holiness lost their lives before they got to Samarkand. It was vital that at least one of us reached you. <laughs> He's a storyteller. <laughs> he should be accompanied by a lute. <laughs> well... I feel unworthy, being the bearer of the Pope's message. But to your message, brought by my father, which begins magnitudinem in celis at... Pachem in terris. His Holiness replies with full heart and soul, peace to all mankind. The Pope thinks peace and the army masses for war. The Pope does not lie. All men lie to achieve their ends. I believe the Pope. I believe my friend Niccolo. And I believe this boy. And you don't believe your own son. Should I? Hmm? Should I believe you? Why do you 
state. We are sure that our Khan does not want to be alone with the Chinese and this Christian. I will send soldiers to find your father. Your Majesty, now that the Pope's message has reached you, my mission is over. I can go and search for my father myself. I don't think you will be allowed to leave. Of late, I've dreamt of being murdered in my sleep. Every place I traveled, I, I saw fear, hate, killing. If the two most powerful men of the East and the West cannot reach an understanding, what hope is there? Why is there so much hate? And why, why is it so difficult for men to live in peace? In war, one knows what one must do. In peace, one is not sure. To be happy, to be well fed, to love. In much choices, much confusion. In war, life is one little truth. To kill or be killed. Is there no hope then? Will man never change? Oh, he must. He will. He has. You two have met. Yes. We met but once. Once? And yet you love him. How is that possible? I saw him. But you do not know him. I have guessed him. You see, the astrologers read the stars, the statesmen make laws, but the heart goes its own way. In the year of the dragon, the emperor's own birth year, the great Kublai Khan now makes his blood tie with his adopted people by choosing a Chinese empress, thus formalizing his vow to give China a hundred years of peace. May his new empress give him a hundred sons. What's he going to do? By his choice of the color, we will know which princess he has chosen.
job is, is quite simple. All you do is bow and look wise. Your Majesty, the Mongols are preparing to attack. We are no match for the Mongol cavalry. Shall we use the magic power? Only I will decide Your that. Serene Majesty, let us at least be ready. So be it. What's going on? as a warrior or as my son? As a son, I've come to apologize for my behavior today. As commander-in-chief, I come to deliver an ultimatum. I accept the apology of my son. As for the ultimatum, be certain the power is on your side. Otherwise, an ultimatum can become a humiliation. I lead an army of Mongol warriors. The palace is guarded by Chinese footmen. So you've come to overthrow your father? We cannot speak as father and son this night. Only as the emperor and his commander-in-chief. I now listen to the commander-in-chief. The army will not give away what they have shed their blood for. At the rising of the sun, if you do not lead us, I shall come and seize the throne. You do not have to seize it. I give it to you. Take it. It is merely an uncomfortable piece of furniture. My cat sits on it. That does not make it an emperor. You will have the right to rule when the dreams and hunger of 200 million people weigh on your soul. If you are ready for that, then I am ready to abdicate. But if the throne is your right to wage a war, then you will have to take it by force. What is it, Father? Age? Soft life? I know it's not fear. Why not attack now? War is never the answer, son. We are warriors. When you were a child, we were nomads. We had no place. We needed land for cattle, land for rice. The times called for war. But now we have a place. We have a country. Times have changed. You have changed. Trust me for all I can give you. Not only as an emperor, but as a father. Curb your passion, son, and learn to wait. Believe me, there is much to wait for. We have waited. We can wait no longer. May I ask a favor of you as a son? Ask? That you will meditate everything I've said. And I hope you join us before the sun rises. I ask from you a similar undertaking. That the morning may not find us in opposite camps. I promise. And an unworthy son bids a worthy father good night.
Sam. The old fox. Outsmarted. The young one. There's no consolation. The magic thunder. Lightning. It is not magic. It is sad destruction, son. Stretch out your hand. Now. And take the world. Man. is ready, Your Majesty. The gifts, the documents, the ambassadors. All wait for your farewell message. Hmm. You will be pleased to hear that there's good news of my father. He is safe in Samarkand. Oh, that is welcome news. Marco. Yes? Whatever you have learned here, convey to your Pope. Do not magnify the good or exaggerate the bad. And one favor, do not speak of my sorrow. That is mine alone. I anticipated your wish, Your Majesty, and so instructed the ambassadors. I'm not going with the caravan. I... I would like to stay here. Because of Chinese philosophy or Chinese beauty? Because of Kublai Khan, hmm. whose wisdom I would be foolish to leave until I've learned everything he can teach me. Marco, I can teach little, but it is the folly of age to give advice. I will welcome any counsel from you, as from a father. It will be given as to a son.